I've never actually seen the this from this. Um, it's kind of fun watching it from up here. It's fun being over there, but it's actually fun watching it from up here. Um, I forgot part of my my greeting was I was supposed to tell you about my family. So for those of you who don't know, again, I'm Carrie May. Um, I worship here with my husband and our son. Our son usually is seen up here, but he has a Sunday off, so he usually plays piano or the drums. Um, we've been calling Living Water our home now for um, over six years, and uh, <laughs> um, Living Water is uh, one body with three campuses. Um, Yelm, or excuse me, I'll save that for the end. Olympia, Lacey, and the best is Yelm. <laughs> Okay. Uh, if you're new here, we're really glad that you chose to, chose to spend your Sunday with us. There is a connect card in the pocket in front of you. Um, please fill it out, get connected. Um, also put a praise or um, prayer request on there. Um, we really do see those. I mean, I personally don't, but I know that our leadership sees them. They see every single card, and they pray for every single person. They actually pray for all the seats here um, before they're filled so that these seats have been prayed for you before you came, and they will continue to be prayed for you as you um, go about your day the rest of the day and the week. So know those cards are really, they, they make a difference. So there you go. Um, I have a few announcements. Oh, but first, <laughs> um, our vision here at Living Water is to make disciples who make disciples. Um, here's what that means to me. What that means is that um, we're actually called to help each other continue our relationship with Jesus Christ. We are actually called to invite people into that relationship and then continue to grow in that relationship together. So there you go. here's my announcements. Women's had a major event this weekend. 240 women at the Olympia campus. <laughs> um, as I said, I do women's ministry here. We have some events coming down the, the calendar. So keep your eyes open. October, there's a good one coming and then in into our um, holidays. So uh, if you have any questions about those, you can find me or Amber. I know she's in here. Um, and Pastor Susie, we all will do that for you. Men, they have something. <laughs> the men, <laughs> the men have a bonfire this weekend um, on Saturday, Saturday, Saturday October seventh uh, at four o'clock. I hear there's hot dogs. I hear there's going to be some uh, axe throwing. It all sounds really fun, so you should go. <laughs> Sign up at the Connect Center. I um, think they, you could bring a dish to share or a bag of chips. I mean, I'm down for chips. Uh, also, men's coffee is starting back up every single Saturday in the um, cafe, 9 a.m. Great opportunity for men to come, and um, you can have a conversation. You don't have to have a conversation, but really just being together. <laughs> I don't know. I am, I can't imagine what it would be like, so I, I kind of want to come, but I know it's only for men, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay, uh, Friday, October 13th, we're going to have an extended night of worship. Now, this is where my heart is. I love worship. And um, if you, like me, just can't wait to just, I am like want worship to continue always. So this is going to be an extended night of worship starting at 630, just a time for us to really feel, um, like Pastor Bob mentioned in his, his message a while ago, the waterfall of God's love and just sit here in his presence. And um, it's going to be a really great time. So please come and join me. I'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, the youth have an event coming up as well at Rutledge Farms. That is October 14th from 4 to 6. Um, there's carpooling that will be starting here uh, at 3 o'clock. So um, sign up and more information in the Connect Center. 
Uh, you can sign up in there. They're going to worship around the campfire, have s'mores and hot dogs, and just a great way for our youth to have some fun holiday times. Um, I think that's my last one. We also have an events page. So all these events and more information are uh, available to you at livingwater.com slash Yelm events. We have a QR code. Um, all that information is also at the Connect Center. So feel free to stop by there on your way out. Um, we are going to now continue our worship by um, giving God his tithes and our offerings. So we'll invite them forward. There are three ways you can give. Uh, livingwater.com slash give. Don't forget to select Yelm in the drop-down menu. You can text to give. You can also um, put it in the bags as they get passed. Um, this, this is just a way for us to continue to invest in our church, in our kids, um, in our community, and also globally because these, you know, we do that. Um, when I give, I honestly just feel like I am a little part of a much bigger picture. So whether I give a little or a lot, I just know that I am helping and I'm connecting with everyone here for something bigger than myself. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you bless, bless each person in this seat and bless them as they give and take what we are offering to you and just um, multiply it and and send it out to where it needs to be and help um, help our community, help our kids, help everybody just really see and be rooted in your forward mission. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, would you thank Carrie May? She did great. Yeah. There you go. God bless you as you give. Thank you for supporting this community. Did you ever have this experience in school where you know, maybe it was in middle school or high school, perhaps college, it's the first week of school, and uh, you walk through the lunch line into the cafeteria, you get in the lunch line, you grab your tray, you grab your silverware, your napkin, the lunch lady, I have this picture of the lunch lady in my mind from my school, the lunch lady hands you a plate with what she says is pizza, you look at it, it's like that could be cardboard with ketchup and artificial cheese. <laughs> You study it closely, you see two little circles that might be pepperoni. You take it, put it on your tray, you move along. You grab the little bowl of, of uh, canned pears, move along. Grab a bag of chips, chocolate milk. And then you walk out into this cavernous room, the cafeteria, and that's when the moment strikes and panic starts to set in. Your heart starts to race. Your breathing quickens. Your eyes are darting left and right, and you're just looking for someplace to sit. Someone who will say, here's a spot for you. You know, your, your panic is now really increasing. The anxiety level is super high, and you see the garbage can over in the corner. You're like, I'm just going to dump the tray and just run. Where? You don't know. Just anywhere but here. And then, in that moment, you see this, this mo motion here from the right side of the room. And, and you turn and you see somebody's waving at you. In fact, there's a whole table full of people. They're looking right at you. They're smiling. And they're waving you over because there's a seat at their table. You know, maybe your version of that story doesn't include being waved over. Maybe, maybe you've spent a lifetime eating alone, searching for someone to see you, to notice you, to welcome you, to invite you in. I, I describe that scenario because I, I, I just believe that there's, there are some people here in our midst right now who long to be welcomed to someone's table. What we're going to discover this morning in God's Word is that for those of us who have chosen to follow Christ, God's Word commands us to live this way with one another. We're in a series called One Another, and this, this series is really about 
the one another's that are in Scripture. There's 59 statements in the New Testament that include the phrase one another. They're, they're exhortations to do something toward another person. They're behaviors that may flow out of, an, out of an overflow of our relationship with Jesus, but they're not behaviors that we do unto Jesus. They're behaviors that require another person. There's something that we do with or toward another person. It, other people must be involved in order to fulfill them. So as we open up God's word, would you pray with me? Jesus, today as we open your word, I just simply ask that you would reveal who you are. We want to see your character. God, we want to know who you are just more more closely, more accurately, more intimately. I pray that you would remind us who we are. Because God, it's really easy to be influenced and absorbed by the world's agenda and identity for us. And so we come against that and we come into your word to be reminded who you say we are ask that Jesus, you would show us who we are, who you are, because you're the one that we're pursuing. You're the one that we want to be a disciple of. We want to know you better. And I pray that your word would be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. So when we leave this place, we're better because of time in your word and time with one another. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that, say amen. Amen. All right, well, today our one another comes out of 1 Peter 4, 9. If you've got a Bible, if you don't have a Bible, we have some. They're free. You can take one home with you. Um, but we're going to be in 1 Peter 4, 9. And this is our one another. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Look at somebody and say, without grumbling. I explained last week that each of our one another's that we're going to go through, and we'll, we'll continue this series through the end of October, each of these one another's are contained in a larger section of scripture. It's in a context. And we have to read that context, read that larger section of scripture in order to unlock the full meaning of the verse. So we're going to do that here. This is 1 Peter 4. I'm going to read 7 to 11. So the verses right before and right after verse 9. Verse 7 The end of all things is near. Well, let's just pause right there and just say, (laughs) yep. (laughs) If you've been reading some headlines, you might agree with that. Like, yep. The end of all things is near. Near. Not yet, but near. Therefore, be alert. Nudge your neighbor and say, hey, be alert. (laughs) And of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. And here's our verse. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. This morning, what I'd like to do is give you a vision of what Christian hospitality is and what it could be here at Living Water Yelm. And I'm going to present a challenge to us that that I believe could radically change your life, the lives of those you encounter, and the life that we experience together as a community of faith. I'm going to give you a couple of points, and then we're going to practice again. Here's the first one. Hospitality looks like God. The word hospitality in the New Testament is written in Greek originally, and that Greek word is philozenos, which literally means lover of strangers or pursuing friendliness to strangers. I like that, that pursuing friendliness to strangers. See, here's the reason why I like that, is you and I were once strangers. We were without hope and without God. We were far away, and we were looking for someone to welcome us in. The reason why I say that is because Paul writes exactly that in Ephesians 2. I'm going to read 12 and 13 and then skip to 19. Paul writes, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Can you remember that time when you were without hope and without God? 
might not have been all that long ago for some of you. For many, maybe it was years ago, and you have to think back, what was it like when I was without hope and without God in the world? 13, I feel like there needs to be like this musical flourish. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 19, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Here's the thing, hospitality, it's what the gospel is. You are a stranger, and God showed you wholehearted hospitality. He didn't say welcome and mean the opposite. He didn't say come on in and then grumble about you being a part of his family. He, he, said, he said, you were his enemy, and Christ died for you. Here's what that means. Here's what I mean when I say the gospel, our sin, our rebellion towards God, our desire to do things our own way separated us from a relationship with our creator, and we became enslaved to sin. It became something that we just were bound to. We can't pay the price for our freedom because God set the price, and the price is death. Romans 6.23 explains that the payment for sin is death. So because of our sin debt, we deserve death. Verse, 32, verse 12 in Ephesians 2 says, we were without hope and without God. Hebrews 9.22 states that God's law requires that to be made right with God, to be forgiven of your sins, there has to be a shedding of blood. Something has to die in our place to pay the price of our sin debt. That's why that's why the Jewish sacrificial system was set up, was to, to create a, an opportunity for something to die in the place of God's people and their sins. But that Jewish sacrificial system of cows and sheep, it was temporary and it was insufficient because every sin required a sacrifice. But Jesus. See, when Jesus came, he came as fully God and fully man. And as fully man, he was sinless. And he paid the price to ransom us, to rescue us. When, he died, when Jesus died on the cross, he shed his own sinless blood. And he paid the price permanently. And in that moment, God waved you over. He brought you close. And he gave you a seat at his table. That's pure-hearted hospitality. Second reason why hospitality looks like God is that hospitality is how God cares. He cares for foreigners and strangers, and you see this throughout the Bible. You read story after story of Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, our God, welcoming in foreigners and strangers into his family, and and then God giving direction to his people to welcome foreigners and strangers because they were once foreigners too. Deuteronomy 10, 18 and 19 gives a glimpse in that story He ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to the foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. So you too must show love to foreigners, for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. That's where the Israelites lived for for 400 years, living in a foreign land, living as foreigners, and God took care of them. And then in the desert for 40 years, God took care of them. Not only does God welcome the outsider and the outcast, but he gives them a family. And Psalm 68, 6 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says that God sets the lonely in families. I was listening to a podcast the other day, and the, the gentleman on the podcast was just remarking, it was almost offhanded, but it was, it was just about the epidemic of loneliness that exists in our culture and our society today. That there's never been a time, and I don't know if this is statistically accurate, but I'd say anecdotally, there just I can't think of a time when there's been so much pervasive loneliness that we have become so insulated, so isolated, that, that statistically this, this is true, that, there, that the number of people without meaningful friendships, it's exorbitantly high. Like there are people in our life today, people in your sphere of influence who don't have any meaningful friendships. They've got acquaintances, they've got interactions, maybe at work, but there's nobody that actually looks them in the eye and cares about how they're doing. And that, 
isn't the way God designed it. God says he, he sets the lonely in families. See, in, in our context, that can be radically different. You and I were without hope. We were without God. We were far away. We were foreigners and strangers. And through Christ, God brought us near, placed us in a family, the body of Christ. See, that, this grouping of people here on a Sunday morning, this isn't just a random uh, conglomeration of people that just decided that they would show up at 717 East Yelm Avenue on Sunday at 10 a.m. It's a, it's a body. It's a family. It's a group of people that... I don't know if you, if you were watching, but when Carrie Mae had us greet the people around us, did you notice that it, it took her a few minutes to get your attention again? And maybe you're one of those people that just sat down quickly because you just, you know, you're just a good student. But there's a lot of people around that were like, they were greeting their friends. They were saying hello to people they love. That's, that's what the body of Christ is. And now we have a responsibility to welcome others and to give them a seat at our tables. Here's my second point, is hospitality is our response. Because what's the response of a stranger who's been welcomed in, bought with Jesus' blood, and made a son or a daughter? It's generous hospitality to others, as if you were serving King Jesus himself. These are the words of Jesus in Matthew 25, 34 to 40. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord... When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. That's Jesus saying that when you serve the least, the lonely, when you welcome them in and give them a seat at the table, you're welcoming Jesus. Let me tell you a little bit about hospitality in the early church. You know, this, this sect of Judaism that was forming as followers, disciples of Jesus, who they believed was the, the risen Messiah, the promised one of Israel. They formed communities in the first century, and the apostles, those that were closest, the 12 disciples that were, were raised up to lead this, this community, they instructed these churches to demonstrate generous hospitality toward others especially toward other Jesus followers. And you see it throughout Scripture. Here's a couple of examples. Romans 12, 13. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Galatians 6, 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. And then hospitality was a requirement for church leadership. If you were going to be a leader in the body of Christ, you had verses like instructions like 1 Timothy 3, 2 and Titus 1, 8 that listed hospitable as one of the traits, the characteristics of a leader in the body of Christ. See, 2,000 years ago, loving strangers was incredibly important to the early church because it facilitated the spread of the gospel. You had travelers that were letter carriers or teachers, pastors, and they relied on the hospitality of others so they could help spread the gospel. Because, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, there, there wasn't um, embassy suites and best westerns back in Bible times 2,000 years ago. In fact, what you had, one, one commentator said that the hotels of that day were just so dissimilar from what we know today. So one commentator writes, it was undesirable to lodge in public inns, which were often the scene of drunkenness and impurity. The Christian's faith cut him off from the pagan practices that generally prevailed there. So you had this this inability to really go to those public inns because it was just, just sin and degradation. It wasn't compatible with the way a Christian was going to live. One commentator continues, it was even more important for believers to find refuge in Christian homes whenever they were fleeing from their persecutors. So if you're under persecution, you're looking for other Christians to, to house you, to give you a place to stay. You can't just go to a local hotel. 
First century believers practiced hospitality also by holding church services in their homes. Next week, uh, Darren and Shelly, would you mind just hosting this entire congregation in your home, just like the early believers? That'd be cool. Sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Got a big backyard. Yeah. But that was what they gathered. It was, in fact, it was about 200 years of Christianity before church buildings separate from homes existed. You had believers holding services in their homes. Romans 16, 5, Paul writes, Greet also the church that meets at their house. 1 Corinthians 16, 19 says, The churches in the province of Asia send you, send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. So hospitality looked like Christians opening their homes for church services and welcoming other believers, those that were traveling. It was part of how they did church. It was who they were. Hospitality is our response as people who once were far off without hope and without God, having been brought near and given a seat at God's table. Hospitality is a characteristic of the Christian life. And frankly, God's word commands it. So what does hospitality look like? Let me give you some practical examples. First, why do some believers lack hospitality? I think there's some legitimate reasons why it may be hard, challenging to demonstrate hospitality. For some, it might just simply be ignorance of God's command that, and a lack of example in, this, in your life. It may be that you just have never seen it, never experienced it, and didn't know that that's what God commands. Another uh, reason why is that a lack of hospitality may stem from a lack of genuine love for one another. Uh, I'll be honest, like in my early days of Christianity, I was still kind of learning how to become fond of other people. <laughs> it's like, you know, I was kind of on the fence about whether I liked humans. <laughs> God, yeah, I love God, but it's people. I'm like, yeah. Go back a couple of messages. The first message in this series was about loving one another. And I mentioned, and you heard Carrie refer to it, that that we need to be able to stand underneath the waterfall of God's love and allow his love then to flow through our lives and to overflow our river banks. But if I'm empty, if I'm not being filled daily with God's love, I have nothing to give away. And so I really do need to experience and encounter God's love for me if I'm going to allow it to overflow my life to others. Now, let's get real. Others may not be hospitable because they're just, they're too focused on spending their precious time and resources on themselves. Or these resources are over, already overcommitted. I'm a selfish jerk at times. I, I like doing stuff that I like to do. And to invite somebody else into that kind of infringes on what I like to do. So I'm, I'm right, I'll be the first to admit, like, that's me. You know, and, and when I think about opening my home and inviting a bunch of people for a meal, I'm like going, well, that's grocery money. I mean, you know, kind of, we're a little tapped already. That means me living a little bit generously. I think there's two other reasons that I thought of. Is another one's just fear of rejection. If you've ever invited somebody and been turned down, I mean, anybody who's asked somebody out, on a date and we're shot down. I mean, that rejection is deep, but, but, when it's, but it's, the same, it's the same notion. If I just say, I'd love to have the Smith family come on over and have dinner at our house, and they, they say, oh, that date doesn't work, and I don't, well, what date does? I just kind of like, oh, okay, can't, <laughs> all right. <laughs> you know, like rejection. I, nobody likes rejection. Except for those of you that are in sales. <laughs> Another no, I'm closer to the yes. <laughs> but I've been turned down, you know, and then people cancel. And so there's, that's real. You have, to, you have to know that you're accepted in Christ and that if another person doesn't accept an invitation, it's not a reflection of your worth and value. Your worth and value comes from Jesus. Yeah. I think the other thing, though, that I thought about this and I was like, And I was like, what else gets in the way? I think I think just 
maybe it comes back to our resources, you know, time and money. But there's, let's just talk about money. It's a lot more expensive to live right now. And, and for this pastor to say, hey, y'all should invite each other over for meals or go out for dinner, I recognize that there are some people who are like, I'm trying real hard to feed the ones that are already under my house, let alone the ones you're asking me to invite. Like, that's legit. I get it. So, like, that's a reality. And yet, here we are with, with a scriptural mandate to, to offer hospitality to one another. So maybe it means we get creative. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can isolate and just say, I can't afford to offer hospitality. Because you have something that you can offer. It may just be simply that, a seat at your table. Hey, you're making dinner, and we're making dinner. Let's do a little potluck and bring all our stuff together and have our families eat together. You know, the first time I experienced true Christian hospitality was probably, gosh, 24 years ago. Susie and I were... Six, six years married, so we had two young babies. We, uh, we were invited to go to Hackettstown, New Jersey to visit a pastor couple that pastored a four-square church there, um, Santiago and Carol Gallegos. And I still remember them. I can still picture them because the impact was so, so strong on me. We left our kids at home. We were, I was a children's pastor at Living Water Olympia campus at the time, and we were, we were invited by our lead pastor there to travel to, to this church in New Jersey to just share ideas about children's ministries. They were trying to kind of revamp their children's ministry. They had asked our pastor what we were doing, and he's like, oh, I'll send Bob and Susie. They can show you what we're doing. And we're like, we barely know anything, and we're being sent as the experts, I guess. But, but here's what happened is they invited us in. They were a little bit older than us, and um, they invited us to their home, this beautiful uh, rural, um, like, farmhouse in rural New Jersey, about two hours from New York City. They uh, gave us a room in their home. And I remember the first morning, because there was a knock at the door, opened the door to the bedroom, and here's Carol with, like, this silver tray with, like, linen napkins. She's got coffee and tea and pastries at our bedroom door. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, this is not a bed and breakfast. Like, what is... So we like, Shh, thanks, and she put it down on the table, and enjoy, good morning, and we're like, coffee and tea and paste, this, this is awesome, I like New Jersey, I, I still tell my kids, like, you could have been raised in New Jersey, you could have been a Jersey girl, um, didn't happen, but, but this was like the first step of getting us to think that way, we were, again, we were two hours from New York City, so Carol and, and Santiago took us to, to Manhattan, downtown, New York, and just showed us all the sights. I mean, this was clearly a few years before 9-11, so we got to go up to the top of the World Trade Center and see the entire city. We got to go on a horse and carriage ride around Central Park, and they took us to a meal at a little restaurant called Tavern on the Green. It's closed now, but it's a famous restaurant right on, on uh, Central Park, and um, like, like pictures of, of celebrities that have eaten there. And I remember like glancing at the, the bill when the dinner was over and it was a delicious meal. And it was like, it was several hundred dollars. And this was back in 99 when several hundred dollars was <laughs> significant. And they just, they just went over and above with their hospitality. And I remember remarking to Susie, I'm like, why? We, we don't deserve any of this. Like what we're bringing is like barely compares to what they're pouring out upon us. Like this doesn't make any sense their kindness, and their generosity. It wasn't to impress us, though they did. It was just to care for us, which they did. And it was, it was built into who they are. Like, that was just who they were. They were, this is how they op operated with hospitality. I want to give you some practical ways to offer hospitality. Just some practical ways. Like, this is like rubber meets the road kind of a, a way to offer hospitality to others. Here's the first one, ask. Ask God to give you opportunities to love through hospitality and to guard you from grumbling when you do it. <laughs> so the first step is just ask. Okay, God, okay, I'm open. Um, give me opportunities. 
Here's another one. Be intentional. Here's an idea. Put down hospitality time on your family calendar for next Sunday. And that way, everyone in your house knows that on Sunday night, you're going to have someone over. They're probably going to watch the Hawks with you, right? But you can cook, you can order in, you can make it fancy, you can make it a crockpot meal. Here's the crockpot expert. I'm not. But I've, I've heard told that you could prepare a meal before Sunday worship, leave it on, and then when you come back, it's ready. <laughs> Amazing. And then be sure to invite people that you don't know well, maybe even a newcomer to church. Because if you don't plan it, hospitality will not take place. So mark your calendars. Here's a third one. This one's going to be radical. Get ready. Just look at somebody and say, this one's going to be radical. radical. Move. (laughs) How many of you are, are sitting in the same seat you sat in last Sunday and the Sunday before that, and the Sunday after that. Right? Come on, show me your hands. You're sitting in the same seat, aren't you? Uh Uh-huh. Yep. If you're not in the same seat, you're like a row behind or below. Here's the thing. If everyone sits in the same seats week after week, you're going to meet like the three people that are around you, and you're not going to meet anybody new. There's a story I remember hearing of one guy uh, at a church, and, and he wasn't on staff. He wasn't a pastor. He was just a single guy who showed up, young man, at this church, and he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sit in a different place, and this was kind of a larger church than what we have facility-wise. I'm going to sit in a different place every Sunday for a year, and he did it. You know what he did? He met a whole lot of people, and by the end of that year, everybody knew him, and he knew just about everybody because he wouldn't just sit in someplace new. He would get to know the people that he was sitting around. So if you come in next Sunday and you're sitting in a different seat and somebody notices, just recall that I said you have permission to move, okay? (laughs) Told you it was pretty radical. Here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. Let's create a culture of invitation at Living Water Yelm. Here's what I mean by that. I imagined this conversation. Let's say... You haven't yet come to Living Water Yelm, but you're thinking about visiting. You're over at 507, or you're down at the local, or you're at your workplace, and and you just say to somebody, I'm thinking about checking out Living Water Yelm. And they look at you and they say, oh, you're going to that church? I hear good things. Um, Just be prepared. There's going to be about five people that are going to invite you to lunch as soon as you show up on Sunday morning. Culture of invitation. What would that be like if people that walked in here, because here's the thing, you guys dominate. You're the the goat when it comes to relentless welcome because when people walk in here, we consistently, Sam, Pastor Sam and I heard it this past Sunday at our lunch with leadership. We heard people say, say, I just, it feels like family. Everybody's so welcoming. There was one woman who said she might be here a few weeks ago. She said, I was just taken aback in the best way possible about how welcoming and how friendly everyone was. What if you upped the ante and this became a culture of invitation where people are not only welcome, but they're invited? I'll give, I'll be the first one in. I'll start you're invited to dinner at our house. So we have a thing called Living Water Essentials. And this this, uh, next Wednesday, the 11th, we're going to just gather at our house. We do this every second Saturday of Wednesday, uh, every second Wednesday, sorry, second Wednesday of the month. Susie and I just invite people over. um, And you can sign up at livingwater.com slash Yelm Events. We're going to talk about what we believe. And I've got some room. There's a few of you that have already said you're coming. I'd love to have a few more come. So I'll never ask you to do something I'm unwilling to do myself, but you're invited. I can't fit all of you, like Darren and Shelly can, but, <laughs> but you're invited. Here's the bottom line. You were given a seat at God's table, so give someone a seat at yours. So this whole series, we're doing some opportunity to practice these one another's, because you can't do one another's 
when you're all sitting in rows. You've got to be looking at other people and interacting with other people. So we're going to have a few minutes here um, of discussion groups. And I'll be doing this throughout the month of October. If you don't like them, you can come back the first Sunday in November. They'll be... <laughs> but I'd like you... I'm going to give you four questions. Um, I'm also going to do this. I'm going to invite the high schoolers. Any high schoolers in the room here? All right. You are invited to go to the cafe this time. Go ahead and stand up. F- follow Nevea. She's going to walk on out. Go for it. Into the cafe. If you're a middle schooler, any middle schoolers here? All right. Middle schoolers, you're going to go out that back door. Uh, this is Chris and Annetta. Chris and Annetta. They're going to lead you out that door and take you down to the children's ministry hallway. Um, and they've got a special treat for you this morning. Man. And the rest of you, I would like you to just turn to the people that you're going to be moving away from next Sunday. And, <laughs> and here's four questions. I'll come up here in about 15 minutes and interrupt you, but here we go. Describe a time you experience true hospitality. Question two, what keeps you from practicing hospitality? Is that an adequate reason? Three, how could you welcome others to your table? And four, who in your group would like to be invited to your home or out for a meal? Yep, that's pretty intentional. Okay, go ahead and chat with everybody. I'll come up and interrupt you when it really gets going good. All right. You know how fun it is for me to just stand and just look out at this congregation, just loving one another? Well done. Would you stand as we conclude our time together and just thank God for who he is? This may surprise you, but you can continue those conversations after service. And I really do hope that you, uh, you just seriously take that challenge to heart. Like, what if, what if this community was one that had a culture of invitation? I'm so thankful, Jesus, that you brought us near to the Father. You, you welcomed us in by your blood. You invited us in. God, we are overwhelmed by your hospitality that you brought us back into relationship with our creator, our father. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Overwhelmed. Great are you, Lord. In Jesus' name.